A very good evening and a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today for the sixth lecture of Inspirit 2021. I'm Swapnali, a manager at the Entrepreneurship Cell IIT Madras, and I'm honored to welcome our guest for this evening, Mr. Matt Cooper. Mr. Cooper is the CEO of Skillshare, an online learning community for creatives with the mission to connect lifelong learners everywhere and build a more creative and prosperous world. Before joining Skillshare, he was the CEO of Visually, an online marketplace for creative work. Before that, he was the VP of Operations, Enterprise and International for Upwork, previously ODES, the world's largest marketplace for online work. Thank you so much, Mr. Cooper, for joining us today. It's a great honor to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So over the past year, we have adapted to staying at home and social distancing. The pandemic has changed life as we know it, from our morning routines to our life goals and priorities. So how did you spend your time during the lockdown? Were there any new hobbies that you picked up or was it a busy time with Kishore? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, I guess a little bit of both. Um, it was a very busy time for Skillshare, I think, as, you know, as the world was sitting at home trying to figure out productive things to do with their time. Uh, thankfully, a lot of them found Skillshare. So we had a, uh, a blowout year, as you might imagine, for anyone in our space. Uh, so work was very busy. Um, we raised our, our Series D uh, round of funding, uh, about $71 million, uh, led by Omer's growth equity out of uh, Toronto uh, with participation from Adobe uh, and uh, our existing investors as well. So taking a $71 million fundraise from start to finish with, without ever leaving my basement uh, was kind of uh, strange and wonderful all at the same time. Um, it personally, there was sort of this magical time where the kids didn't have sports Nobody was traveling and our weekends were just quiet. I have four daughters. So we spend a lot of time on the weekends driving around in circles from one sporting event to the next. Uh, so just having nothing to do on the weekends was uh, was quite wonderful. So I spent a lot of time uh, bike riding, did my first 100 mile bike ride. I rode from, uh, I live in New Jersey outside of New York, rode to Pennsylvania and back. Uh, you, you know you're bored when you ride to Pennsylvania and back. Um, but, uh, you know, it was certainly a strange time, a lot of, uh, a lot of anxiety all around, a lot of people concerned about just, you know, obviously health and wellness and, uh, in addition to lots of other things. But I think we were very lucky in that, you know, I, m me and my healthy, my, my family, we were all healthy and, uh, uh, work was, was going well. So we had some stability that I know a lot of other people did not, unfortunately. It's great that you found time uh, to spend with family and catch up on other hobbies. Uh, so we understand that uh, you've spent a significant time working with two-sided marketplaces, starting with Upwork and now Skillshare. This has become quite a popular business model these days. Many big companies in the world today, uh, like Amazon, YouTube and PayPal, are two-sided marketplaces. So what do you think fascinates you about this model? Um, yeah, I, I kind of got my first taste of it at Odesk Upwork. Um, and I think the, you know, the two-sided marketplace models, they are very hard to get going, right? You always have this, this chicken and egg dynamic. You have to have supply to get demand. You have to have demand to get to supply. Um, but once that flywheel starts to spin, marketplace businesses just have a, an operational inertia that is really hard to replicate in the other, any other model. Um, so it's funny, I, you know, we see, I see a lot of marketplace startups um, and I think there's this myth that if you just build both sides, stuff starts to happen. And that's not how it works. You know, you have to, between that chicken and egg dynamic, you have to fake the chicken for a little while uh, to quote the former Odesk CEO. Um, so when you look at kind of the early history of any of these marketplace businesses, you generally have to manually run one side until you get enough buying and selling and enough liquidity in the market that you can kind of step back. And, you know, for Odesk, it was dragging freelancers onto the platform. They would go find a job. Somebody would call in and say, Hey, I need an engineer. And somebody on the, on the receiving end would say, Hey, great. Let's, you know, we'll let our marketplace go to work. They'd hang up and then they'd jump on Skype and start 
contacting a bunch of Indian and Ukrainian and Russian engineers trying to figure out if they can get somebody to take the job. Now, once they got to a certain point, they could sort of step back and all of that happened on its own. Same thing for Skillshare. In the early days, we had to drag teachers onto the platform to get enough content and to go get enough students. And now we're at a point where every month we get about 200 new teachers and about 800 new classes without lifting a finger. So um, once you get it up and running, they're a lot of fun, uh, but uh, it is a lot of uh, sort of manual work in the beginning just to, to get that flywheel spinning. Um, I think the other aspect of this is just the freelancer uh, component. Um, you know, freelancers are entrepreneurs, right? They are building their own business and it just happens to be a business with one employee. Um, and so, you know, I saw this firsthand at, at Odesk, Upwork. Um, I spoke at a conference in Bangladesh uh, and I signed autographs for two hours. Uh, I'll still get messages from people who I met at that conference and their Upwork profile is the two of us. Um, you know, so just the the very personal impact that that platform had on those freelancers, those entrepreneurs was really impressive and, uh, and meaningful to me. And so when I started, when I first met Skillshare and I started looking into the business, I saw that same connection on the teacher side. When you look at our teachers, most of our teachers are freelancers, they're contractors, they're consultants. We are one way that they're making money. Um, and I think I look at the impact we have both on our teachers and our students personally, professionally, creatively, um, and again, particularly during COVID, you know, our teachers needed a stable source of revenue. We were able to give that to them. Our students desperately needed something constructive to do to either develop their professional skills or just get their mind off the world at large. And we were, we were able to do that. So, you know, I think the, the, the very personal impact that you can have for these freelance entrepreneurs is something that is important to me. And it's a beautiful part of our business. Right, the power to connect uh, two sets of people and make a difference in their lives must uh, be really exciting. So uh, you talked about freelance uh, marketplace as well, uh, giving opportunities to freelancers. So how do you think this uh, freelance industry has evolved over the years now that more people are looking at it from a sort of mainstream career uh, option perspective? Yeah, it's just the the broader acceptance of freelancing as a career, um, but also just side hustles and having multiple sources of income. Um, you know, when I first started at, at Odesk in 2009, you know, like it wasn't a thing. People, you know, you should, yes, you hired a freelancer or a contractor, but they came into your office. It was a short stint and then they went off to their next project. You know, whereas companies now, massive companies are building this into part of their ongoing workforce planning. And it's not just the contractor who can come into the office, it's people on the other side of the world. Um, and so, you know, in the early days, it was kind of a wild, wild west. And this whole concept of online work and the gig economy, and you didn't have Uber, you didn't have Grab, you didn't have, you know, all of these, you know, on-demand delivery services, um, so it just wasn't a thing yet. Um, so just seeing the evolution over time and how it has gone from sort of this strange thing that a few people figured out how to do to nobody thinks twice about jumping in an Uber. Uh, and I think more and more companies are looking at platforms, uh, online freelancing platforms is just how they do business. Um, seeing that acceptance is great. You know, when I started, I started the enterprise business at Odesk. Um, and we took it from zero to a $60 million top line business in three to four years. Um, and in the early days, so many of our customers were thinking of this as this secret weapon that nobody else knew how to use and nobody else had figured out yet. Um, and, and they took great pride in the fact that they had figured out how to tap into this global talent pool and nobody else had figured it out yet. So the fact that we weren't very well known, they loved the fact that it was kind of under the wire. And, and so now to see that, that acceptance kind of go mainstream has been great. Um, I think the the other thing is just the verticalization and specialization. Um, and, you know, many years ago, you kind of saw this with, in the States, Craigslist and eBay, right? There, If you looked at, there's sort of a fam- bunch of famous posts around, if you take Craigslist and eBay and you take it the verticals, 
all of a sudden people were starting to disaggregate this into the, all these different verticals. So you had StubHub for tickets, you had you know specialty sites for sneakers. Um, so you have all of these different verticals. You still have a couple big horizontal players, but now Fiverr, who was the creative vertical freelance player, is a public company. Um, yeah, so you've just seen that specialization pop up. You know, and and I think that's sort of where Skillshare comes in as well. You know, they are doing online freelancing, they're doing local freelancing, but now they're doing online teaching and coaching uh, and mentorship as part of their overall uh, earnings power. So it's, you know, I think it's a, it's interesting to see how kind of the promise of the internet where you can aggregate this global demand around very specific verticals and build a big business. You know, that's certainly music to our ears and a lot of what's driving the fundamentals uh, of our business. That's true. And I think uh, the pandemic has only accelerated the need for remote uh, work opportunities and flexible timing. Yeah, there's so many companies who prior to COVID would say, oh, there's no way we could ever work from home. Um, yeah, they figured it out for the last 18 months. It seems to be working pretty well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've got friends who are in banking and trading and hedge funds, and they would never have thought they could pull it off. And all the banks are still alive. They're making money hand over fist right now. So uh, it seems to be working. Okay. So looking at your current role as CEO of Skillshare, Skillshare recently rebranded to shift to an exclusively creative focus, which gave it a unique market position. It must have been hard to walk away from many different sectors and zero in on creative skills. So what gave you the confidence and resolution to restrict your courses to the creative domain instead of, say, trying ways to increase the engagement on the other courses related to technology and finance? Yeah, it, it took me a while to get there. Um, I mean, when I started, I was actually pushing us to do a lot more in business and tech. Um, and we had evolved. I mean, we were we are still we to some degree still are a completely horizontal platform. Um, there are certain topics that we have stopped allowing on the site, but, um, you know, we do have finance classes, we have business classes, we have tech classes, but we had developed a specialty over time, um, just sort of organically in creative topics. And so as we made this push to build out our content library in business and tech, everything was just hard. It was slow. And, and the reality is when you look at any of these horizontal marketplaces, it's not one monolithic marketplace. It's a bunch of vertical marketplaces to, that just happen to be stuck together. So for us, we already had that flywheel spinning and creative. So as we started to make a push into business and tech, if it was something that was adjacent to our creative core, like marketing, it did great. Um, front end web design, you know, there were enough creatives that needed front end design skills that that you know was an, a logical carryover. Uh, but data science and accounting there just wasn't enough buying and selling there. So we would bring a finance teacher onto the platform. They would teach a class. We just didn't have those students. So we had that chicken and egg issue that we needed to get that flywheel spinning. Uh, and so you know, we had in one, one employee in particular, uh, Alyssa, uh, who was running our original content team at the time, was just all over me about That's, this isn't who we are. This isn't what we should be doing. We are creative. Let's focus on creative. Uh, and so we had a management team offsite uh, in May of 2019, and we just laid it on the table. It's like, can we build a big global and hopefully one day public company focusing on the creative vertical? But that means we have to walk away from these other things. Or we, can we actually do that? Do we feel comfortable with it? And you start looking at the size of the creative economy and the size of, of the, the, the vertical and you look at all the other companies who are, are creative focused. Adobe has done quite well. Apple has done quite well. Spotify, or, uh, so, excuse me, um, Shutterstock, Etsy, Fiverr. Um, you know, there's a pretty long list of big global billion dollar public companies who are focused on the creator and creative economy. Um, there are 5 billion people in the world who have either a creative profession or a creative hobby. Um, so kind of as we got comfortable with the size of the market and, and we looked at the fact that we were the clear leader in the creative space, we got, we got comfortable that this was the right direction for us. Um, and, and when you, you know, every, every startup talks about focus, 
and the value of doing fewer things better, it's really hard to walk away from a market the size of tech and business and data science and all of these other things. So, uh, you know, to your point, it's just, it's difficult to do, but once we did it, everything about our business got better. You know, we know exactly who we're going after. We know who we're building for. We know where they hang out. We know what they talk about. The community driven part of our business got better because, you know, the engineers and the creatives talk about different things. So now we have a, a community, they share the same interests, they share the same values, they share the same language. You know, it just, the, the subscription model got stronger because people don't go from front end development to accounting to watercolor. It just, it, yes, it might happen, but it just doesn't. You do go from photography to watercolor to interior design, right? Those users tend to migrate within those sectors. So, um, really, every part of the business got better once we uh, sort of got up the uh, the backbone to to make the hard decision. Right. So you saw this uh, massive demand for uh, a creative platform, and you were already doing well in the creative sphere. So you decided yeah. to expand vertically rather than. Uh, yeah, at some point, you just take yes for an answer. You know, if it's if it's working, don't quit. You know. Right. So uh, as Kilsha just did, uh, finding a product market fit is an uh, important milestone for every startup. So what do you think are the common mistakes that startups make uh, when they're trying to define their customer base? Or uh, what factors do you think uh, they should consider when they're trying to define what uh, their brand stands for? Yeah, um, I think the you know, it, it's a it's a very similar decision point that we went through looking at creative. Who who can you solve for? Who do you really you know? Where do you add the most value? Like who do you really solve for? What is that one core user who can't live without what you do or what you offer? And then build out from there. I think there's a tendency to try to go really wide, really fast, as opposed to go deep early. Because it feels like, ah, my market's not big enough. I can do all of these things as opposed to how can I solve this one critical problem for this one user and then build on that. Um, and then you can either build vertically or you can build horizontally, but you know what your core is and you know what you're building off of. So I think finding, I think a lot of companies are scared to find product market fit for a very narrow user base because when you go into pitch, it's like, ah, you know, the VC is a big, ah, yeah, the market's too small. But if you've got a recurring user base that loves what you do and can't live without it, you can build on that. That's something to grow off of. If you go super wide in a massive market, but nobody really cares that much, you just, you haven't gained anything. So I think having the guts to, to stay small and stay focused and stay, um, you know, fairly narrow in your product market fit early makes a ton of sense. And then you can build on that over time. Right. So a uh, startup should uh, learn to uh, be okay with having a smaller but uh, more interested uh, target audience. Uh, so how do you think this shift in branding that Skillshare did has influenced the way customers think about the Skillshare community? Yeah, yeah it's interesting. I mean, I think one of the indications that we're doing something right on the brand side is we've had a lot of inbound interest for partnerships and, and business development from companies who are looking to access the creative community. Um, you know, we we now have classes on, you know, on American Airlines flights in the U.S. Uh, we just signed a, a deal with Cathay Pacific. Um, we, you know, we did a, a creative partnership with Bombay Sapphire Gin. Um, yeah, you know, it's just companies that would not have talked to us had we called them three or four years ago are now calling us. Um, so, I, you know, we have, I think just once we shifted our branding and our focus and our messaging around that creative vertical, now people know who we stand for. They know who we serve. They know what value we bring. They know that we know that community and that community has respect for us. Um, so it's, I think that's you know, kind of that inbound BD interest is probably the best representation of what that that focus can do for you right so this has given you kind of uh, an exclusively creative uh, audience to uh, for anyone to approach you with uh, yeah. 
so with skinshare projects as you said there's this vibrant community of uh, learners and teachers from around the globe willing to offer constructive feedback so how did this come to be was it a planned effort uh, by skillshare or did it happen organically over time yeah it it kind of happened organically um and you know i think the the original business was was actually in person classes um so our founder when he started the company the idea was let's do in person classes taught by a community of teachers in the local community um and so they started in new york uh they found some early success with the model in new york so you can kind of think of it as the early version was kind of a combination of like meet up in general assembly right so it had the community vibe of meet up but it had the in person class structure uh of a general assembly class um the they had traction in new york that trouble scaling it outside of new york where you didn't have that population density um at the time they were seeing the moocs take off um in all of the online education models so they moved it to online and that's when things kind of probably 2013 2014 is when we landed on the current version of the business um so that that community focus was certainly a part of the first version of the business model and that did kind of carry over into the online model the other thing is if you look at how our classes work um every class has a sort of a class discussion page you can ask questions you can get feedback um and then we have the projects so every class is required to have a project that's a core part of our pedagogy we want you to learn by doing we want you to actually put the skill to work we you know you don't learn anything just by sitting back and watching right you got actually got to go do it you got you got to try it you got to you know do the exercises um and so the when you upload a project you get feedback from other students you get feedback from the teacher so those community components kind of just moved from the original offline model into the online model um and i we actually i still think we have a long way to go uh to build other community features we have a a very nascent sort of groups discussion forums feature um but i think the particularly for creative focused endeavors there's sort of this um very exposed moment where you create something new and you put it out there to the world um and I, you know i i'm the ceo and when i uploaded a picture of my illustration you know like i drew a bird i drew a tree i drew a giraffe you know and here i am the ceo of a company and i upload it and i'm nervous like i don't know if anybody's going to like it or be like this guy might be a ceo but he sucks at drawing you know like it's sort of this this crazy moment and um i think to have a positive affirmative supportive community around that uh is really important so it had you know it sort of we had some roots there kind of evolved organically over time but we absolutely think it's critical to the business to the the the, the teachers the students so much of the value they get comes out of that community and and i think business wise we think that that will drive above average retention over the long term we want our users to think of themselves as members not subscribers that's great i think community is also gives a sort of motivation boost to be able to uh, finish something when you know your so now that the world has gone online how important of a role do you think communities play in driving retention say from the perspective of a company yeah i mean i think it's yeah, again i we view it as just absolutely essential to the business um yeah and i even I, you know i think we saw this play out during covid i mean com- people were sitting at home in their basement looking for looking co- for things to do and ways to connect and you know i don't think we're looking for any more excuses to be on zoom meetings but it's nice to have a comp- uh, you know a community out there that shares your interests and your experience and that you can talk through uh, these things with them. so you know whether that's you know skill share community as part of our product and for our members but also like how do we create community for our employees and keep those connections when we're not necessarily seeing each other in the office every day um i think it's just it's important to maintain those connections to keep people around whether that's trying to keep your employees at skill share or trying to keep your skill share members on the platform 
Yeah, the pandemic was a difficult time for many of us and uh, positive communities and creative skills are a great respite from the stress of everyday life. Yeah. Skillshare 2 saw a spike in students during the lockdown. So what percentage of them uh, would you say look at Skillshare as a sort of mental health booster and how many come with the intention of upskilling and finding employment opportunities? Yeah, it's um, very, very roughly, we're probably about 60% sort of people are doing it for personal reasons and hobbies and about 40% professional. Um, that said, there's a lot of bleed over. So you may be a professional graphic designer and you come in to learn, you know, the, the new technology or tool or, or technique, uh, but then you'll go take the interior design class or you'll take the watercolor class because that's what you like to do for fun or vice versa. You might be a, you might be an engineer by day, but you love shooting for, you know, uh, photographs. And then you start doing some, you know, you shoot some weddings or you shoot some portraits uh, on the weekend for extra cash. So there's just a lot of, a lot of migration between personal and professional. So it skews slightly more personal, but there's a, there's a lot of gray area in between subscription for all courses model has also uh, helped us quite a bit to overlap with that's right yeah and that's that's why we love the subscription model like if you watch 10 minutes of a class and you get bored with it and want to try something else great go you know i think it it just allows our users to test and explore and try new things and and the other thing we've seen is you may like if i want to learn how to use radial symmetry in uh, adobe fresco I just go to that one lesson in a larger class and I learn how to do that one thing. So we will see people jumping around between classes and going straight to lesson four instead of starting at lesson one, because that's just, that's what they want. That's the value they need. Um, and so the ability to jump around and, and mix and match and um, kind of chart your own course setting is really valuable. And this has also given them the flexibility to uh, do only parts of courses if they wish to learn. Not That's right. Yeah, exactly. So talking about remote work during the pandemic, most companies have had to operate entirely online for the past year and a half. Skillshare was also listed on the 50 best remote first companies to work for in 2021. It must have been a challenge for Skillshare to manage a global office of people in their home, own homes. So how did you ensure that the team was equally optimal and productive as in the offline? Yeah. Yeah. When you know, it's funny, I, a couple couple months ago, uh, we pulled up the email I sent um, when we first decided to go home and you know, work from home due to COVID. And, you know, now, uh, a year and a half later, it seems so naive uh, and, uh, and ignorant of what was actually going to happen. Uh, but, you know, the message is like, hey, we're all going to go home for two weeks and let this thing blow over. You know, it's like, oh, whew, boy, did I miss that one. Um but uh, we, at the time, uh, we had about 70 employees, roughly 50 were in our New York office, and then we had um, roughly 20 kind of scattered throughout the world. Um, we had just started building a team in uh, Medellin, Colombia, um, we had, but we had people in Canada and Europe and uh, in other countries. So we had already, you know, we already had some of the plumbing built to just work with the distributed team. Um, and so when we all went home for those two weeks turned into, you know, a year and a half and counting, um, it really wasn't a difficult transition. I think it was surprisingly smooth. Um, and we also like, we all worked from home on Tuesdays. Um, so we had kind of already built a culture of flexibility. And if you need to, if you want to go, go to your parents for two weeks around Thanksgiving and work from there. I don't care. Like you're a grown up, get your work done. Like, you know, we trust you. And so for us, the migration, because we kind of had that trust and transparency. And if you act like a grown up, we'll treat you like a grown up. Just go get your work done. I don't care where you are. That model translated very easily into kind of this fully remote model. I think the interesting thing that we saw was the people who weren't in the New York office suddenly got more, much more productive. Uh, because they could hear, they could see, like it was a level playing field now. Whereas if you were the only one who wasn't in the New York conference room during that meeting, 
it was just kind of hard to tell what was going on. So yes, we had the, you know, whatever we were projecting up on the screen, but you can't see people. You can't quite hear people. There's a siren in the background. Like, so it just, once we were all online, everybody had equal footing. Everybody could see and hear and participate equally. Um, and then for our New York employees who all of a sudden no, no longer had to commute, I mean, my commute round trip door to door is an hour and a half each way. So three hours a day, I suddenly had back, you know, so family gets a little, I get a little and company gets a little, like I got three hours to spread around all of a sudden. So uh, we actually saw productivity go up. Um, I think the challenge is people didn't quite know how and when to turn it off. You know, with the laptop is always sitting there and there's always more work that can be done. You know, there's no train to catch. There's no forcing function to get you out of your seat and to end the day. Um, and you don't have that break between work and home. I mean, I walk upstairs, you know, like that's it. So um, I think that took some adjustment and we had to get battered saying, hey, I'm signing off. You know, it's 630. I'm done for the day. See you in the morning. Um, and then try not to sit there and send emails and slacks all night, you know. Uh, so I, it took some adjustment, but overall our productivity went up just because it saves you so much time. Yeah, so more than that, uh, team culture and bonding is, uh, in as is an integral part of office interaction as well. So how did you take that online? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that part we're still figuring out. Um, in our, so now, so we've let our office lapse. Uh, we have no central office. Uh, our team can go meet at, uh, we have a, a deal with Industrious, which is a, it's a WeWork competitor. Um, any of our employees can drop into an industrious space whenever they want or need to. Um, so particularly for people who just, for whatever reason, can't work at home, they can work from industrious. And so we'll see people kind of organically say, hey, I'm going to meet. I'm going to go grab a desk at the Union Square industrious space if anybody wants to meet. And a bunch of people go meet there that day. Uh, so it's kind of happening organically. Uh, but then we're going to do big company-wide events twice a year. So we'll do one at the beginning of the year, January, February timeframe. We'll do one mid-year, July, August timeframe. Um, and, and, and the goal is to have that kind of be the big touchstone cultural events. We probably won't get a damn bit of work done, uh, with, and that's fine. Like, you know, we'll have some meetings. We'll pretend like we're working, but ultimately it's, you know, it's a time for everybody to reconnect and, and kind of build those social connections and talk with people they don't see every day and, and have some fun. Um, so that's the plan. It's, you know, as you can imagine, it's constantly evolving. Um, nobody wants to get on a Zoom happy hour. So like we're trying to find other ways to get people to, uh, uh, to reconnect, whether that's one-on-one -on -one coffees. Um, you know, we do, we play games, we'll have speakers come in, you know, we try to do other things that um, you know, we think can, can bring value and inspire the team without having to sit around and look at me on the screen a little more every day. That sounds great. I think we all agree that uh, there's some things that just have to be on offline and can't really translate. Yeah. So what do you think the future of work for the sector looks like? Will companies tend to go fully remote or will there be a gradual transition to the offline mode? Also personally, which one do you find more productive? Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. It, when things you know, in the spring, at least in the U.S., when when COVID started to slow down in the spring, there were a lot of companies that came out and put a firm stake in the ground saying, we're coming back to the office. We're going back to normal full time, five days a week. It's a requirement. You may have moved away. You need to move back. Like they would put a pretty firm stance. They all folded like a lawn chair. Like it just, you can't get the toothpaste back in the tube. Like people don't want to go back to the office five days a week. It's just not going to happen. Um, and the companies who are forcing it, you know, it's like great. As soon as I see an announcement that some big company is forcing people to go back to work, it's like, hey, recruiting team, go after every engineer that they have. Because um, you can go live wherever the hell you want. I don't care. Get your job done and, and live your life. You know, so I think the I just think the companies who take a too harsh a stance on in-person work are going to lose. 
they're going to lose a lot of talent. And, and they're, you know, like I look at the talent that we're landing right now because again, we're flexible and we treat you like a grown up. It's, it's amazing. It's such an advantage for us. So, you know, look, there is, there is a downside. I miss seeing people in the office. I love being around the team. It's fun. Um, I just don't know that the three hours a day round trip is worth it. Um, so if there are other ways to get that, um, get that connection and, you know, our exec team, we get together at least once a quarter. Um, you know, we do a couple of day offsite. We have a, we stay overnight, we have drinks, we go to dinner. Like there's just other ways to solve that interpersonal connection that's missing um, without having a three hour commute every single day. Um, Cause I, I love my team, but I love the fact that at four o'clock today, I can run over to my daughter's soccer game and then come back and finish my day. Um, that's really hard to go, hard to give up. So um, I just think this is where, I think the world has been heading this way for a long time. Uh, yeah. this is what drove Upwork's business. People just got more and more comfortable working with a distributed team. Um, COVID just accelerated it by five or 10 years. That's right. I think uh, we all had more time to do other things and going offline would be quite a difficult transition again. Yeah. Uh, now, I would like to touch upon the recent round of funding that Skillshare raised for expansion, uh, focusing on developing the global market and Skillshare's enterprise offering. Uh, over two thirds of new member signups on Skillshare are already outside the United States and India seems like a promising market for Skillshare. So how does Skillshare plan to venture into the Indian market? Are there any conscious efforts to make Indian courses, say the Indian cuisine or crafts on the platform? Yeah, and that's, you know, as we look at kind of how we think about localization. So, I mean, you pointed out two thirds of our new users are from outside the US. Um, India is actually our number two country by traffic, um, but we've not yet optimized for these international markets. So we see lower conversion rates, we see lower payment capture rates, we see lower engagement retention rates. Um, you know, India, you know, at least the the population is English speaking. Um, now you may have, uh, you know, I know you have lots of other languages, um, but you know, at least there's that common. Uh, common language. Um, obviously, as we look at Western Europe and some of these other growth markets, that's a problem that we're going to have to solve. Um, but right now, we have a lot of English-speaking users from international markets who are trying to sign up and join. We only offer PayPal and credit card. Those are not good options outside of or in many markets, if not most markets. So uh, like we look at the payment capture rates in India, they are excruciatingly low. Um, so we have customers who want to buy us and they can't pay us. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, it's a high class problem, but it's a problem. So we need to fix that quickly. We have been completely overhauling our payment system to allow local payment methods. We'll have PTM, we'll have UPI, uh, we'll have sort of uh, local credit card processing. Now there's a lot of transition right now in the regulatory environment in India around payment regulations and recurring payments in particular. So we're grappling with, you know, India is still sorting out some of what those rules and regulations need to be while we're trying to build the infrastructure to support that. Um, so that is underway. Um, then, you know, we, we rolled out localized subtitles for five major languages that last summer. So at least if your English is a second language, you can hear it in English, but you can see it in your local language. We are going to we're kicking off sort of full localization of the site. That should be done early next year. Um, we are starting to launch. So we have our community content that comes from our thirteen thousand teachers, um, but then we also have what we call Skillshare Originals, which is when we produce classes ourselves with bigger name influencers within the creative vertical. Uh, we'll be launching some Skillshare Originals with Indian teachers. Um, we're gonna start some programs to get Indian teachers onto the platform. Um, so we are kind of gradually pushing this forward on all fronts, but if we kind of think of the, the full life cycle, the full funnel, first you gotta be able to pay us, then you gotta find content that that's interesting and um, you know, that is both, you know, I think the interesting thing about, thing about Skillshare, like 
part of the value we offer is you get to learn from people on the other side of the world. So if you want to learn that Japanese style or you want to learn that African style or you want to see what the designers in Paris are doing, you have access to that. Uh, but obviously, you also want to understand what people in your market are doing who understand your culture and think about things the way you think about them. Um, so we're trying to find that happy medium of giving you local content, local flavor in a way, delivered in a way that you would expect as an Indian, uh, but also giving you access to this global talent pool and this global information base that you wouldn't have access to otherwise. So we have to find, find the right mix there. That sounds amazing. I think we all look forward to seeing more of Skillshare in India over the next few years. Yeah, and we are, we are hiring an Indian market manager right now. So if you know anybody, send, send them over. <laughs> so, uh, so what do you think are the fundamental differences between uh, the customer base and uh, the United States and India? Yeah, uh, you know, I think we're first, like we're still learning. Uh, you know, we're doing a lot of research, and this is part of why we need a local market manager. I can read reports all day long. It's not the same as someone who's actually living in, you know, and grew up in the culture. Um, we have a, we actually uh, have three Indian Americans on our exec team. So we have, we have a little bit of insight. Um, one, one grew up in India. Uh, the two grew up, uh, the other two grew up in the U.S. So we have a little insight, but we really need that intel on the ground, who's in the market every single day. Just see, I mean, things are evolving over there so quickly, as you know better than I do. Um, so, you know, I think that some of the high level things that we have seen from initial research, the Indian users tend to approach Skillshare more as professional development and upskilling. So there's certainly the creative personal angle, but it's, I think the the overall view of online learning in India has much more of a, an ROI focus to it. So if I take this class, how's it making me better at my job? How's it pre preparing me for my career? It just has a more professional spin to it. Um, so when we think about sort of new features like certificates and, and deeper certifications, um, that's something that we hear more from Indian users than we hear from uh, US users or other markets. So we're starting to think about how do we evolve the product to maybe we show a different mix of content. Maybe we lean towards, you know, when you log into your Skillshare homepage, it skews a little more professional, a little less personal. Um, maybe, you know, if we're going to roll out certificates, if you want to be a Skillshare certified logo designer, um, maybe we launch that, we launch the beta in India instead of the U.S. So I think there are some interesting things we can do uh, just knowing that there's some, just a slight shift in focus in that market. But that said, we are still very early in kind of learning about the Indian market and understanding what the nuance is. That's interesting. And we'll put out an ad for the market manager, is that? All right, good. Done. So, uh, Skillshare for Teams seems like an interesting opportunity for companies uh, looking to provide additional incentives to employees. So how does the enterprise offering work currently and what are the plans to adapt it to the post-pandemic job ecosystem where uh, creativity sounds like a great source of stress relief? Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. I mean, the, the enterprise business certainly changed when we made that shift to a creative focus, right? When we were going broad, it was easier to go into an enterprise and say, look, we've got creative, we've got business, we've got tech, We've got all these things. We look and feel like other learning and development platforms you might have. We just have better content and better engagement. Um, once we shifted the business to really focus on creative, it became less clear how we go sell a big company-wide enterprise deal. Yes, we can obviously add value, sort of traditional learning and development upskilling value for your creative team, your marketing team, um, you know, how to create a good PowerPoint, that kind of stuff wasn't as obvious how we were going to help your engineers or your accountants or your HR staff. Um, our suspicion is that we probably fit better as a perk and a benefit uh, as opposed to we're going to make your accountant better at his job. Um, so one of the things that we, we were sort of just kind of reorienting around that when COVID hit. And that actually was, you know, fortunate timing because 
a lot of companies who we used to offer lunches at the office. We used to offer coffee. We used to offer happy hours. We can't do that anymore. So what else can we give our employees, particularly during a really difficult and scary time that is positive, it's creative, it's expressive, it's anxiety reducing. Um, and so you saw the enterprise business, <coughs> excuse me, at companies like Calm and Headspace and you know, these meditation and, and health and wellness apps, um, we offer the same benefits. I mean, there is something, you know, I, this, I'm, I broke my finger, so I haven't made much progress on it, but like I'm, I'm knitting the world's ugliest scarf and it, it is actually surprisingly relaxing, you know? Like, and so, you know, as we started to reframe Skillshare for an enterprise crowd, kind of thinking of it as like, we're not going to make you a better employee, but we can help you be a better person. Uh, and the fact is like creative pursuits are just good for you. They're healthy. Um, and like creativity, it's not just knitting a scarf, like connecting the dots in new and different ways. It helps you professionally. And it helps you personally. Um, so I think we had a slightly different spin on it. Um, and, you know, our enterprise business has doubled year over year. Uh, we've seen our, our BD and partnerships take off. Um, so I think that that shift in, in how we position and package the enterprise offering has been been very helpful in our growth. Yeah, I think uh, creativity and a great mental health also spills over into other areas of your life. Yeah. So, great. Uh, so now we have a few audience questions that we have collected beforehand as well as uh, from the chat. So I'll put them up to us again. Uh, so the first one says, uh, freelancing in the education and upskilling sector always needs a quality check to maintain consistency and reputation. How does Skillshare keep up the quality of content that's produced? So we, we review every class that gets uploaded to the platform. Uh, so uh, we have a team of content moderators that go through, they review the class and they score it against a standard rubric that we use around audio quality, video quality, teacher engagement, et cetera. So that kind of initial read on the class allows us to just give a rough estimate of how good the class is now, if it doesn't meet our standards, we send it back to the teacher saying, hey, you know, you need to make these changes or it fell short in these ways. Um, cl classes that, you know, meet the standard, great, they're on the platform, off they go. If it's an exceptional class, then we might give it a staff pick and promote it uh, and really push it to the platform. So it's a way for us to help uh, new teachers in particular sort of get exposure if they're producing great content. Because all of these platforms you always have that cold start problem where it's hard for new users, new teachers, new freelancers to break in because they don't have reviews. They don't have minutes. Like nobody knows that this class is any good. So that manual review on our side helps us at least make an early assessment of how good it is. Then we start to see, all right, are people watching the class? Are they engaging? What are the ratings? What are the bounce rates? What is the project upload rate? Like we've got all this data around the classes that we can then use to decide what classes are really good, that drive engagement, that drive retention, that we should push forward, and which classes are not getting attention or they're getting bad reviews that we either need to suppress or pull off entirely. So That's we try right. to use the combo of the algorithmic and the, and the, the manual review. I think this is also what uh, differentiates uh, platforms like Skillshare from uh, something like YouTube where there is no quality control as such. Uh, so the next question says, uh, initially Skillshare gained a lot of traction with advertising on YouTube and its content creators. So can we get insights on how this decision was favored and helped Skillshare? Yeah, um, I would describe our, our explosion in influencer marketing somewhat as dumb luck. <laughs> you know, I think the, when we, when I joined uh, in November of 2016, we really had done very little uh, marketing at all. Like we were spending, you know, a very small fraction of what we spend uh, every month today. Um, so the, we, as we started to test and iterate on different channels, it's funny, we, our original take was, eh, influencer marketing doesn't really work for us. Um, but the team kind of stayed on it and kept testing a couple of different things and, and finally cracked the code. Uh, and now, 
you know, last time we pulled the data, we do more influencer marketing spots on YouTube than any company in the world by about 2x. Um, so we are just, and, and I think what we have figured out is you can spend a lot of money on big names, but you don't actually get the right engagement. It's kind of the more mid-tier and long tail of influencer that have a more authentic connection with their crowd. Um, that's where the opportunity is. Um, now it's, it's a massive operational lift um, to do that kind of long tail of, of influencer, but that's what we've built up over the last couple of years. Um, now, even, you know, at some point, you know, it, you know, you've done a good job when people make fun of you for how many Skillshare ads are out there. Uh, so when, when you become a meme, that means you've done quite well in that channel. Um, so now we're, you know, we're continuing to invest in influencer marketing and, and scale that, but we're layering on some of the more traditional channels like paid search and paid social and other things to just help us diversify a bit. Uh, Cause we think there's a lot of opportunity in other channels that we haven't necessarily gotten to because we didn't have to, you know, we were doing so well with the influencer marketing. Um, it just, you know, we, there's only so many hours in the day, so it was working. So let's keep doing it. But now we're starting to branch out a little bit as we get bigger. And I think it also uh, worked out because some creators on YouTube were teaching courses on Skillshare and they brought right. that crowd with them. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, that was an interesting uh, sort of re revelation. Like we, the first, first big teacher where we did that, uh, Frank, uh, Thomas Frank. So he had, he had done some influencer marketing for us the year before. And then coming into January, which is one of our biggest months, we said, Hey, why don't you teach a productivity course? Um, and we'll, we'll do it, you know, a double, a double hit. We'll have you promoting Skillshare, but you'll be promoting your own class. Um, and it was just a crazy success. Uh, so we've done that with him twice now. Uh, and we've started doing that with some other influencers as well. It's been a, a really effective combination for us. That's great. Uh, so the next question says, uh, being a leader, you have to take the growth of the organization and its employees into account. So how do you work on improving yourself? And are there any metrics or a routine that you follow for this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the, in terms of just the internal health of the business, we do these semi-annual surveys and uh, you know, basically employee engagement surveys. Um, and we use a tool called Culture Amp uh, that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, and basically, you know, we have, and there's a couple of different ways to do it. You can use Culture Amp. There's a, um, uh, I think it's Gartner has like 12 sort of employee engagement or Gallup, sorry, it's Gallup has these 12 questions that you can ask to gauge engagement. Um, but we do these, these annual or semi-annual surveys, and then we'll do these short pull surveys in between just to give us data on how's the team feeling? What are they excited about? What are they not excited about? How likely would they be to refer someone kind of the NPS score type um, and consistently our engagement scores are in the low 90% range. So, you know, that's kind of my, my metric and my gut check of just how is the health of the organization? Um, but then also like our, how does our exec team work together uh, and how are we functioning as a unit? And, we, we actually, I hired a, uh, an outside firm, two consultants uh, to basically, they're executive coaches, but they're coaching us as a team. Uh, so we have one-on-one -on -one sessions with them, but then we also have team sessions with them. And it's really around like, how do you have constructive conflict? How do you communicate well? How do you make sure that you are, you know, getting true alignment, not like, everybody kind of agrees, but nobody really wants to say something. So you just kind of let it go. Like that's not alignment. Like you got to force some of these issues to the surface and have the hard conversations. And, you know, I think that's something we've been working on. And, you know, I think if anything, our problem was we were too nice, um, you know, and it's hard to rock the boat and we like to get along and we like to have fun and we like working together. And, and sometimes that makes it difficult to have hard conversations. And so as I think about how, you know, the dynamic within the exec team absolutely filters down to the rest of the organization. So if we can't have, you know, uh, engaged, direct, no holds barred conversations with each other, the teams aren't going to be communicating well either. Um, so that's, 
you know, that's kind of how I've been thinking about how I'd evolved. I have an exec coach and then, but helping us evolve as an exec team has been a, a, a big focus because, you know, as, as you get bigger, the job only gets harder, right? The stakes get higher, the problems get bigger, the organization gets more complex. Like every day my job gets a little harder. Uh, and so we all have to constantly grow and evolve. And, you know, there's sometimes that I'm ahead of it and sometimes I'm playing catch up. So uh, you just, you got to constantly work on it. That sounds like an interesting framework. I'm sure the audience would find something to take away from this. So for the last section of the talk, we have a rapid fire. So I'll be asking you questions and you'll tell the first thing that pops into your head. So the first question is, if you were to teach a creative course on Skillshare now, what would it be? Uh, how to reupholster a car. Uh, I bought an old car um, and spent, and this was, this was one of my other COVID hobbies, uh, and I completely uh, revamped the interior. So I hijacked my daughter's sewing machine, and uh, I, can now, I can now do a pretty good job of reupholstering car panels. Cool. We'll all watch that course. <laughs> Uh, so what did you read most recently? Uh, I'm sorry? What did you read most recently? Uh, what I read most recently? Uh, let's see. It is a uh, sense of urgency. Uh, I, I took the cover off. But um, uh, by Cotter, uh, it's called a sense of urgency. And it's basically kind of talks about you have healthy urgency and then you have unhealthy urgency. And unhealthy urgency is you're running around doing stuff, but it's not actually focused and directed. And then you have complacency. And so as you think about how organizations, you know, when they're effective and ineffective, you tend to fall into one of those three buckets. Either you're doing nothing because you're complacent and you think you've got everything figured out, uh, or you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, but you're not actually moving the ball forward, or you're focused, you're aligned, uh, and you're moving with a healthy sense of urgency. So that's been, that's been my latest read. Uh, okay, what's one thing you're excited about that's coming up in 2022? Ooh, 20, I mean, 2022, it's the international launches. You know, we're, we're getting a lot of the kind of infrastructure in place um, in Q4 of this year. And then we're going to start doing some more meaningful international pushes um, early next year. So looking really looking forward to that. I just think it's a, it's a huge growth lever for the business, but it also – you know, just bring, it injects a lot of vibrancy into the creative community when you've got people coming in from all over the world. What do you think is the most important attribute of a successful leader today? Um, I think it actually, it's communication and humility. Um, you know, I think the, there's sort of this myth that you're supposed to know everything. Um, and the really good CEOs know very well that they don't. Um, my job isn't to have the answers, it's to figure out who does uh, and then make sure that those people are empowered, aligned, they've got the resources they need and then get the hell out of the way. Um, it's hard to do, um, but I think the, and then just the communications, particularly as the company grows, you know, we all have to be pushing in the same direction. And if I can't communicate where we're going and why and what's important and how we're going to measure it uh, for the team at large, it's just hard to keep everybody focused and, and directed. So those are kind of two things that immediately come to mind. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, get a real job. <laughs> I, uh, I had come out of, I'd come out of investment banking uh, and I was talking with uh, two guys uh, that were uh, venture capitalists. And I was saying like, how do I make the transition from uh, from banking into venture capital or private equity. And the guy was like, go get a real job, go work for a company, go run a business line, go sell something, go build something. He's like, you're good at a spreadsheet. That's it. Like you have no idea how to run a business. You have no idea how to manage a team. Uh, and he was absolutely dead on accurate. So that was uh, quite transformative for me. I think that's something we can all, uh, that applies to all of our lives as well. Yep. So also I spot a guitar in the back. Do you happen to be into music? Sorry, I lost you. Uh, I spot a guitar in the back. Do you happen oh, to yeah. be into music? 
Yeah, I do. I've been playing the same bad, uh, bad guitar since eighth grade. So yes, uh, I play. It, I have a. I tend to be kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. So I can play, uh, but not that well. This has been wonderful interacting with you, and I learned a lot from this session, as I'm sure our audience members did as well. Once again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I could continue thank asking you. you questions for the rest of the day, but we've already taken a lot of your time. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, and I uh, hope it was helpful. Yes. I would like to thank our audience members for tuning in to watch the final lecture of Inspirit 2021. A feedback form has been shared in the chat. Kindly take two minutes to fill it up. Thank you, and goodbye.